You're listening to the weekly Parsha podcast with Ari Goldweg, recorded with Hashem's never running assistance in Ramah Hashem Israel 5780, 2020. This week, if you're in Chutzlart, so you're reading Parsha's Korach, if you're in Eretz Yisrael, you'll be reading Parsha's Chukas. And although at the beginning of this week's Parsha, we don't really have a buffet or Shem Medrash, an explicit Medrash, which connects the two Parshas, I would like to share with you a Medrash at the end of last week's Parsha, and a Medrash at the beginning of this week's Parsha, or, I'm sorry, the beginning, the end of the Chutzler's Parsha, for me it was last week's Parsha, and the beginning of the Eretz Yisrael Parsha. And we'll see how they're connected. There's very, they're both very interesting, and we'll see a very great thread, a very great lesson that is in both of them. Now, the, there's a Medrash before, which I have to read, because there's just no getting away from it. The Medrash before is not completely, completely connected to my point, but it is also. And the Medrash talks about the fact that we find that Titus HaRasha, Titus HaRasha, he was the one who destroyed the Beis HaMegdash, he destroyed the Second Temple, Titus. And the Gemara tells us, and the, and the Medrash tells us, that how did he die? He was such a big bal gaiva, he was such an egotist. He had the chutzpah to destroy the Beis HaMegdash, the Temple. How did he die? So Kodesh Baruch Hu took a very small mosquito, or a gnat, a yatush, and it climbed into his ear and it buzzed around inside of his brain for many years, it drove him crazy, grew to the size of a bird, or maybe turned into a bird, and eventually Titus died because of this small mosquito that was inside of his brain. And the Medrash tells us that what is the idea? This is an amazing thing. Hashem's way is to, that, that his shlichus, the messengers that he uses, are small things. Small things. Whoever is misgoy, right, Titus, so the Medrash tells us that he took, a, he took a sword and he slashed the parochas, the curtain of the Beis HaMikdash, and it, it was miraculously bled. And he thought that he had killed HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Chas V'Shom Kiviyachol. He had killed God, which of course is impossible. So such gaiva, such, ego, such egotism, Hashem wanted to knock down his ego with the smallest thing, with a bug. Hashem is going to do the same thing in the future times, before Mashiach comes, he's going to take down the nations of the world with very small things, maybe even with something as small as a virus. As the Pesach says, It will be on that day, it says Yeshaya, chapter 7, verse 18, Hashem will whistle to the fly, which is at the edge of the Nile River, and to the, to the bee, which is in the land of Assyria. So Hashem uses something small to bring down the great Goliath, the great giant, the great Gaiva, the great economies. Why does Hashem do it? Because it's all this I couldn't help but read that Medrash. Now on to our point, which actually, as I think about it, really will be connected very much to what we're going to speak about. Umat Aaron. So at the end of Parshas Korach, so we have the contest. Because Rahu wants to prove, Moshe Rabbeinu wants to prove that he didn't make it up. When he appointed Aaron, it was because indeed there was something special about Aaron. He was a great person. He was a tzaddik. He deserved it. He was chosen by Kodesh Baruch He didn't make it up. So he took, a, he took a staff of each of the 12 tribes, each of the Nesim, and they wrote the names of the, each tribe onto each staff. And he laid them next to the Aaron. He laid them Next, in, inside of the Mishkan, inside of the, ta- uh, the tabernacle. And what did he see? What, did, what, what happened the next morning? Pasuk tells us, they woke up in the morning and they saw that the mate, all of these sticks, which were dead sticks, dead wood, the mate of Arna Kayan had grown, Yotzit uh, Porach, it had sprouted and it had grown Shkedim, almonds. Amazing thing, it was the proof that he was chosen, he was the Bechir Hashem. Now this mate, says the Medrash, is a very interesting st- a staff. Actually, there's two different pshatim in the Medrash, exactly what was the staff. But the first pshat, Yeshem Hu Amate Shoyeb Yad Yehuda, very interesting, so interesting. 
It was the staff that was in the hands of Yehuda. Judah, the, the forebear of Mashiach, Shnemer Umatcha Shebiyadecha, refers to the staff that was in his hand. So he uses the same word, of Mate. The Yesha, who Amate Shabiyad Moshe, who Neatz Moy Parach. It was in the same, it was the same Mate, but those who say it was the same Mate that Moshe Rabbeinu held when he did all of the miracles in Egypt. It was the same exact staff. And that was the staff of Aaron, and that was the staff that grew. Shanem Ravine Parach Mate Aaron. Okay, that's one shot. And I think that we, we've learned Medrash enough together to know that when the Medrash says more than one shot, often they're just two sides of the same coin. In, in, this, uh, in this particular Medrash, it's not so clear how, how they are two sides of the same coin, but, but it's definitely uh, intertwined lessons. The second shot is very interesting. He took a piece of wood. He took one thick bean. And he cut it into 12 sticks. And he assigned a stick to each of the 12 tribes. And one of them was the tribe of Levi, which represented, was represented by Aaron. He said, you guys are all using the same piece of wood. Okay? So if there's only one piece of wood that's going to have something miraculous occur to it, you can't like think that we're, we're all using the same pieces of wood. The same root, we're from the same root. And there's going to be one stick that's going to be different, okay? They're all dry. The Aaron's was not alive any more than yours. The reason that he did this, he wanted them all to see that they were all dry. Okay? He didn't want anybody to make fun of it. He didn't want anyone to say that it wasn't real. It's very interesting. Hashem was geyser, which can mean he decreed, or it could also mean that he cut. Hashem placed the, the name, the divine name, onto this, onto the makal of Aaron Akoin. Okay? It's the same name that was on the tzitz, on a special, uh, um, what's the word? Uh, it goes on the metzach on the forehead, and uh, it says Hashem's name on it. It's the same exact name. So in in the night, because of the name of Hashem being on it, it sprouted. It created fruits. What was the idea of the shkedim? What was the idea of these fruits of the almonds? The idea of the shakid means. The word shakid means to, to, to be there constantly. Who is coming constantly against the tribe of Levi? Those who were indeed coming against them, those who were the enemies of Moshe, the enemies of Aaron, the ones who were saying that indeed there was some kind of nepotism, etc. They were proven wrong. That's why I use the word shakid. Those who were coming against them consistently, constantly, coming again and again after Korach was destroyed, people kept coming with these tainas. They were proven wrong. That's why I'd use a shakade. Okay, Medrash gives another understanding of why. I'm not going to read that. Says the Medrash to complete the first thought. Says an amazing thing. That mata, that staff of Aaron, was in the hands of each of the kings of the Jewish people. And then, when the kingship ended, so it was hidden away. And that very same staff is going to be the staff of the Messiah. He should come speedily in our days. Shanamar, as the Pesach says in Tehillim, in, in Psalms, written by King David himself. The staff of your power, Hashem, will be sent. You will send. He will send from Zion. And Rede Bekeh Vecha is going to strike the enemies of the Jewish people. Okay, so the idea, what is the concept of the Mate? What is the concept of this, of the, of the, of this, uh, I'm, losing my, I'm losing my words here today. What is the concept of the staff? What is the idea of the staff? The staff is something which the king takes and he uses to discipline the people, right? 
Right now in Eretz Yisrael, a person walks out without a mask. It happened to a close relative of mine today. Walk out without a mask, you get a fine. 200 shekel fine he got today. Now the fine has gone up to 500 shekels. That's the power of the king. Discipline. We need to, we need to, the laws need to be followed. And that's the power of Aaron. That's the power that he has the mate. He has the, you know, why does, why does each of the 12 Nisim, rep, why is each of them, each of the princes represented by a staff? Because they're the ones who are the leaders and they need to use the staff. Sometimes we can speak nicely and we can get our children to, to listen. Sometimes we need to, there needs to be uh, negative reinforcement. There needs to be the threat of a punishment. Okay? But the idea here is, just like we saw with Titus, that Hashem takes a small thing and He wakes them up. So too over here in this Medrash, it's a similar idea really, which is that there's a wake-up call. That mata which Yehuda had, which Moshe Rabbeinu used for the makas on Mitzrayim, was the same mata which gave a rebuttal to those who would question the leadership of Aaron, who would question the leadership of Moshe. There was a rebuttal. And, and not only that, but that rebuttal came from the very same wood, the same, the same chip off the old block, the same block of wood as all the other Shvatim, to show that, look, this is the leader. This is the one who is ri- rises above, who is raised above. This is the one who has the jurisdiction to say, this is what needs to be done. Moshe Rabbeinu has a right to say, those who rebel against me, he is the king. Those who rebel against me, they will be struck down. Because Kal Yisrael had, had challenged that. And so that was the response. The response was, this is the king. This is the king. This is the staff of the king. It's the same staff of an Aaron. And that staff provides life. Right? The, the dead wood comes to life. The, the physical, we could say, the physical part of the human being, Kal Yisrael needs that leader. Because otherwise we're falling asleep. We need to be woken up. We need a staff sometimes to wake us up. Sometimes we need a punishment. Someone who's a big Balgaiva like a Titus. Hashem has to bring a small mosquito to prove to him that his Gaiva has to be shut down. He needs to stop thinking that he's so great. That's the message here at the end of Parshas Korach. Now what I'd like to share with you is something from the beginning of Parshas Chukas. Medrash says something unbelievable and we'll see that although at first glance it doesn't seem connected, I believe that it really is. Zos chukas. Zesh kosuf. You know, we have at the beginning of Parshish Chukas the, the mitzvah par aduma, which is a chayk. It's the quintessential chayk, the mitzvah that we don't understand. It's the mitzvah of the Torah that we don't understand. What is it about this mitzvah that we don't understand? It, the the Medrash tells us that there's a dual aspect of the par aduma. When, when do we need the paraduma? When someone touches, comes in contact with a dead body. When someone comes in, con- in contact with something which is tummy, something which is impure. Someone, a, a person who's not alive. They become impure, they can't come into the base hamikdash. There are certain things that they can't touch, certain ki- t- kinds of fruit. They're matame, they cause other things to become tame, become impure. But, how can a person get out of this impurity? So there's a special mitzvah called paraduma. You take the ashes of the paraduma, of the red heifer, and there's a whole process, seven-day process, go to the mikvah, etc. And indeed, at the end, the person is purified. But the thing is like this. The person who handles the efer apara, the halacha is, that the person who is actually involved with the handling of the preparation becomes impure. It causes someone who is impure to become pure. And it causes someone who is pure to become impure. And that's the stira. How could it be that something which causes this person to become impure causes somebody else to become pure? It's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense on the surface. Right? That's the chukah. That's the chukah. It's a chayk. It's impossible to understand. That's what the word chayk means. But really, we're going to see that that's not really exactly what the word chayk means. The Pasik tells us, it's a Pasik in Eo, says that who will give something pure from something impure? Loi Echad, is it not the one? Meaning only Hashem is the one who can give something. It's very interesting. The Pasik asks the question, who 
will give, who will make something pure from something impure? Is it not the one? Is it not Hashem? Is it not only Hashem who could do such a thing? Ask the question, ask another question. Kigoyin Avraham Yiterach, says the Medrash, we find this idea, for example, Avraham Avinu, Abraham, came from Terach. Abraham came from someone who was a Russia, who was an idol worshipper, and he was the one who brought the idea of one God into the world, Avraham Avinu. Chizkiah Me'achaz, the great Tzaddik, the great king of the Jewish people, Chizkiah, Hezekiah, his father was a big Russia, Achaz. Yoshia Me'aman, Yoshia Hosea, I'm sorry, it's not Hosea, I don't know how to say it, in Josiah. Yoshia came from Amon. Yoshia was a tzaddik, his father was a Russia. He said that Mordechai Mishimi, Mordechai came, he was a descendant of Shimi ben Gera, who was a Russia. Yisrael may avdei kachavim, the Jewish people, Hashem took us out from Egypt. Hashem took us out from all of these lands of so many people, the non-Jewish world, which for the most part are idolaters. Hashem takes the righteous out from the place of darkness. Right? That's where we become a nation in Egypt. The world to come, we are only able to merit by being in this dark world, by being in the world of darkness. It says the Medrash, Gevaldik, Darshaning, the Pasuk, so beautiful. The Pasuk says, The Medrash says, Who did this? Who commanded this? Who decreed this? Is it not Hashem? Is it not God? The Medrash goes through a number of different locations, a number of different places where we see that indeed things are the opposite of what they would seem. It doesn't make sense. An Avram Avinu is going to come from a Terach? Think about it. Rivka Imenu came from a Besuel, a Rasha. Rachel and Leah came from a Lavan. What a great, wicked person. And to, to, to think that they had children who were so righteous doesn't make sense. What's the word? Miyasakain, who did this? Who thought of such an idea? Migozarkain. Lo Yechida Shalom, is it not the is it not Hakodesh Baruchu, the Yechida Shalom, the one, the one? Lo Echod. And he brings down at the very end, he brings down this, this whole contrast between the fact that the Paraduma, on one hand, has the ability to cause someone to become impure, on the other hand, has the ability to cause someone to become pure. Does both things. Who th- who who would do? How could it be something that causes someone to become impure causes someone else to become pure? How can purity come out of impurity? Omar Hakadosh Baruch Hu ends off the measure. Hashem says, "Chuka chakakti." I created this statute. Gzera gazarti. I made this decree. Etarasha lavor al gzerasi. You're not allowed to transgress on my decree. Now, what's interesting here is like this. I was describing this to my son. We were discussing this. You know, you have a, 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 stone, a large stone. And a person who's a sculptor comes and they, and they sculpt a beautiful sculpture. They, they knock out the, outs, the, the outside of the stone. With their, they chip it away, chip it away. And wow, it's a beautiful sculpture underneath. Right? And you ask the sculptor, how did, you, how did you do that? And the sculptor says, you know, it was there inside. I just had to take away the dross. I just had to take away the bad stuff. And we saw the sculpture underneath. And you know, when we have a question, me or who, whose idea, how did, who did this? Who works this way? Who brings a tzaddik out of, out of a rasha? Because the who does. The questions, when we ask the question, that's how we learn Gemara. That's how we learn Taira. When we ask the questions, it's the, it's the contrast. The contrast between the darkness and the light is when we see the light so clearly. That's, that's the word of the, of the para aduma, is you see death, and you see darkness, and it puts a person in a place of tumma, of impurity, and it puts a person in a place of questions. How could it be? How could Kodesh Baruch Hu allow 120,000 plus people to, to pass away from this sickness? What a terrible thing. What a terrible, terrible thing. We don't understand. Mia Sakin. Somebody asked me at the beginning of, of the coronavirus you know, what's the right approach? And this is something I heard from my Rosh Hashiva. He said about the Holocaust, it's so important to teach children not, not cover up the facts. Just say, we don't understand. 
We don't know why Hashem does these things. We don't know. We do know that Hashem is good. We do know that ultimately Hashem has a plan and that everything that He does is really for the good. We don't know though. Mi Asakein, who does this? Mi, mi Gozarkein, Mi Tzivakein, who is the one who made this Gzera? Why is there death? Why are we sad? Why is there Tuma? Why is there impurity? We don't, why, why? We need to ask why? And we need to know, is Yechida Shalaylam? Even there we need to say, is it not the Yechida Shalaylam? Is it not the, the unified one? The one who everything is good and somehow even good and evil within HaKadosh Baruch who all is good. That's the, that's the Chakika. You, you take away the darkness and underneath is the goodness. Underneath is the light. Who shall give pure from impure? That's, that's the lesson here. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful statement. We don't understand why, but somehow darkness produces light. Somehow tzaddikim come from Rishayim. Somehow dark situations produce light, produce geula, produce a new stage, a new place, a new way of being. You have someone who's a Titus, such a big Balgavi, he's so separate from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he thinks he's killed God. HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes a little, little thing and takes down that darkness, takes away that darkness of separation and shows, I'm the one. I've been here all along. You didn't do anything. You want to see what's going to take you down? A little bug, a little mosquito. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, there's dry wood, dead wood. Dead wood. But from the dead wood can grow. An amazing thing. It can grow, come, come to life. All you need to do is acknowledge simply who it is. Because Rebbe says, it's me. You think that Moshe Rabbeinu is making this up, that Aaron, his brother, is the one? I chose him. I chose him. I'm the one who chooses an Am Yisrael out of the nations of the world, that Klai Yisrael is special. Why? Because Klai Yisrael is to bring life to everyone else. Aaron Akain is to bring life to everyone else. Moshe Rabbeinu is there to bring life to everyone else. And sometimes it's with a stick. Sometimes it takes a stick. Sometimes it's the darkness that produces the light. Sometimes a child, in order to become obedient, needs to hear that they're going to be in trouble, that there's going to be a real repercussion if we don't do what we're supposed to do. And that, I believe, is the message of Pashas Chukas, of the Mitzvah of Paraduma, that darkness produces light. Somehow we don't understand it. How does it happen? How does it happen? We keep asking, but we know. As we ask the question, we know the answer without understanding it. We say, how is it? We got to do it. Hashem's the one who did the Gzera. Hashem's the one who decreed so. But we don't understand it. And then we have, on the other side, we have the mat- have the proof. The proof is right there. Because Shabbat does things in subtle ways, like with Titus, and like with us, we have this amazing worldwide message, unbelievable message. Hashem is speaking to all of us, and He's saying, here I am. Don't think it's you. It's not you. It's me. And in the darkness, there's so much light. And it's hard to see it. And we need to keep asking. But the question that we ask isn't the kasha. It's not, it must be wrong. The question that we ask is, it must be you, Hashem. How could it be? It must be you. How could it be? It must be you. How could it be? And when we ask that question, from the dry wood, from that darkness, comes life. Comes a recognition that it's all Him. That it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's all to produce greater life to produce Shkedim almonds, to produce Yatsetsu Parach, Hashem's name is there, etched into the Mata. And that very same rod which Hashem uses, the kings use, and, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu uses to strike the nations, to strike Paro, and Mashiach will use to strike the nations. That very same rod is the rod of redemption. 
I want to bless you and I ask you to bless me. Hashem should help us to be able to ask the questions correctly. To be able to see the darkness and see that there's light somehow produced from that darkness. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful Shabbos. This podcast was made possible through the gracious donations of listeners like you. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.arigoldwag.com or search on iTunes, Ari Goldwag.